Crazy Starving Heretics, Knights Who Worship a Bronze Head, and a Heavy Metal Rock Band. That's today on Footnoting History. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Nathan, and welcome to the February 23rd edition of Footnoting History. So, I have a confession. I love and hate conspiracy theories. What I really mean is that I love certain kinds of conspiracy theories. Anything to do with crop circles, 9-11, or who shot JFK, I'm not interested. What I like are old conspiracy theories. Either conspiracies about something that happened at least a century ago, or more, or actual conspiracy theories from before the 20th century. But the entire concept of conspiracy theories is absolutely fascinating, as is the psychology behind them. In a way, conspiracy theories are incredibly comforting, and people flock to them because they offer a sense of, of narrative, of cause and effect, for what otherwise might be chaotic or unrelated events. So today, I want to talk about one of my favorite conspiracy theories, and it's also become one of the most popular in recent years, though not necessarily in the form that I'm going to talk about today. Our story starts with the Cathars. Now, the Cathars were believed to be a sect of heretical Christians living in southwestern France in a region known as Languedoc in the 12th and 13th centuries. Okay, so right off the bat, I need to acknowledge that even though a lot has been written about the Cathars, and in fact, to this day, they are a huge part of the tourist industry in southern France, talking about what they are is extremely problematic. This is because most of what we know about the Cathars comes from the people who were hunting them, namely ecclesiastical inquisitors of the Catholic Church. In fact, our main source for the tenets of the Cathar faith comes from Inquisition records, where people were asked a series of often leading questions to determine whether or not they harbored any deviant or unorthodox beliefs. More on that in a bit. So the 12th century was a time of reform for the medieval church. It is in this century that the authority structure of the church really begins to solidify, and eventually, by the end of the century, we can begin to talk about a hierarchical, centralized Catholic church. One way in which the church began to reform itself was by standardizing clerical education. You see, for most of its history up to this point, Christianity tended to take on slightly different flavors as it fluidly adapted to meet the needs and pre-existing beliefs of local cultures. Also remember that even though we start to get a reemergence of towns and continent-wide trade in the 11th and 12th centuries, most of Europe is still highly rural, and in places like the mountainous territory of Languedoc, villages and towns could be extremely isolated. So often the local priest would come from the area. In fact, he might even have been the son of the previous priest. It was not unheard of, even as late as the 11th century, for rural priests to have concubines or bastard children. And don't get me wrong, they weren't supposed to, but clerical celibacy wasn't really efficiently enforced until the 12th century. Anyway, these priests often had a bare minimum of theological training, which was a real problem when their parishioners had practical pastoral concerns, like what happens to our souls after death, or what happens when we celebrate Mass. So what can happen is that priests work from their own personal logic and what they know of theology, and, well, if put on the spot, people can come up with some really interesting theological conclusions. And so one of the reforms of the church in the 12th century will be to try and standardize Christian belief by enforcing across the board minimum education levels for all of the clergy. Which brings us to the Cathars. Now, we know very little about how Catharism starts or where it comes from. Most theories posit that they are somehow related to the dualist heresy of Bogomilism, which arose in what is today uh, Bosnia and Serbia, dualism being the belief that there are two equal gods, a good god, who is the god of the spiritual realm, this is usually associated in Cathar belief with the god of the New Testament, and the evil god, who oversees the physical realm, according to Cathars, this is the god of the Old Testament. According to our Inquisition sources, this is sort of what the Cathars believe. Briefly put, Cathars believe that our souls are fallen entities from the spiritual world, and when the physical evil god, the god of the Old Testament, created the universe, we were tricked into inhabiting physical bodies, and thus became trapped in the material world, where we're forced into a cycle of reincarnation as long as the world exists. By extension, anything in the material world is evil, things like too much food, material wealth, and definitely sex, because reproduction perpetuates the cycle of rebirth into the material realm. The Cathars also had a huge problem with the institutional hierarchical Catholic Church. 
For them, things like Mass, with its eating to symbolize the Last Supper of Christ with his apostles, was bad because it glorified the physical act of eating, and the physical world is bad, and, well, you get the idea. They disliked baptism for the same reason, but the Cathars did supposedly invent their own version of these rites, which was known as the Consolamentum, which you took once in your life as a Cathar. Cathar believers were supposed to receive the Consolamentum, which wiped out all of their sins, as close to death as possible, so as to avoid acquiring any new sins or overmuch contact with the physical world, so that their souls could be freed from the cycle of reincarnation and go to heaven to be with the good God, the God of the New Testament. However, a Cathar, and that name, by the way, means pure. It's the same root as the word catharsis, uh, purging, usually emotional purging. A Cathar could receive the consolamentum early, before their deathbed, and thereby become a bonum, or a good man. They're sometimes called perfecti, but that's not necessarily a term that they used. These could be men or women, and they would adopt a life of extreme asceticism and poverty after this. According to the Inquisition, these bonum, or perfecti, were the leaders of the Cathar Church, and would go from town to town, living off the generosity of other Cathars, and creating a network of believers throughout southern France. Other sources suggest that the Cathars actually had a kind of shadow organization, including their own bishoprics. The whole issue of Cathars, as I said, is highly problematic, because most of what we know about them comes from the people who believe that they existed in massive numbers and were trying to hunt them down. So we don't actually know much about Cathar organization, and at least one historian, Mark Pegg, has argued that the Cathars might not have existed, or if they did, it was considerably different from the picture that the Catholic Church painted. In fact, what was perceived as an organized heresy could just be the result of poor clerical education, as I was talking about before. But, according to ecclesiastical sources, Catharism had grown rampant throughout the towns and villages of late 12th century Languedoc, and the entire region needed to be purged. The centralizing papacy sent a number of envoys to the region to try and ferret out these heretics. The problem was that Catharism was highly anti-clerical and stood against the authority claims of the Catholic Church and the Pope. These claims resonated with some of the aristocrats of southern France, who saw increasing centralization also happening under the French kings in the north, and therefore Catharism became closely linked with the independent political aims of the lords of Languedoc. Long story short, after several decades of internal efforts to ferret out these heretics, in 1208, Pope Innocent III called for a crusade against the heretics of southern France. This was done in response to the murder of one of his legates by some local knights in the service of a Cathar sympathizing lord. Now, where there had been calls for, if not crusades, at least something crusade-adjacent, against the Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula for quite some time, this was the first time that a crusade had been called against heretics within the bounds of European Christendom. And the response to this call for crusade was substantial. You could get all of the spiritual benefits of going on a crusade without all the hassle of having to go all the way to Jerusalem in the Holy Land. The problem is that, whereas it was easy to tell who your enemy was in the Holy Land, in southern France, you can't tell who is a Cathar just by looking at them. And as many members of the Languedoc nobility took great offense at this ecclesiastically sanctioned invasion of their lands, the lines between spiritual and political blurred even further. This is one reason why the Albigensian Crusade, uh, so named for the town of Albi, which supposedly harbored a large number of heretics, why it lasted so long. For 20 years, until 1299, this conflict dragged on, finally ending with the surrender and imprisonment of Raymond, the Count of Toulouse. But just because the local nobility were brought to heel doesn't mean that this heresy suddenly disappeared. So in comes the Inquisition to clean up this mess, find suspected heretics, and impose Orthodox Catholic belief. Pockets of Cathars resisted this imposition for several more decades, until one final stronghold of Cathars remained at Montsegur. In May of 1243, a little over 200 Cathars holed up in this hilltop fortress near what is today the French-Spanish border, where they were besieged for nine months until they finally surrendered in March 1244. At that point, all 200 Cathars were burned for their heresy. I should note at this point that people were only ever put to death for being heretics if they were persistent in their heresy. That is, they confessed to being heretics, promised to abandon the belief, but then go back to it. And when they were put to death, which wasn't as often as you might think, it was by secular authorities who were cooperating with the church, not by the church itself. But that's an issue for another podcast. So this is where the conspiracy theory starts, because according to legend, the night before the Cathars surrendered, four Cathar bonum, or perfecti, were able to escape out of the fortress, possibly through secret tunnels under the mountain, carrying with them the great Cathar treasure. Now, what exactly this was is a matter of great speculation. 
Obviously, because it didn't exist. Some said that this was an enormous stockpile of gold or other valuable items that the Cathars had accumulated. But the slightly more popular theory is that the highly anti-clerical, anti-Catholic Cathars, now there's a tongue twister for you, were the secret guardians of the Holy Grail, the cup that Christ drank from at the Last Supper, which was then, apocryphally, used by Joseph of Arimathea to catch the blood of Christ as it dripped off his body at the crucifixion. This was perhaps the holiest and most sought-after relic in all of Christendom, and some people want to go even further, to contend that the Holy Grail didn't mean a physical cup, but rather the bloodline of Christ, his children through a woman, often Mary Magdalene, and the treasure that they spirited away was the last descendant of Jesus himself, the one thing that, if it were to become public knowledge, would destroy the Catholic faith. Now, before we go any further, we have to have a little bit more backstory. Namely, I need to tell you about the Templars. The Templars were a military religious order, founded in Jerusalem in 1119. The Templars, whose full name was the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, were founded to protect Christian pilgrims who wanted to come to the Holy Land and visit Jerusalem and other sites mentioned in the Old and New Testament. Think of them as a kind of bodyguard tour guide. However, these guys weren't just knights, they were also semi-monastic. They took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, just like monks. But unlike monks, their purpose wasn't to pray and contemplate, but to be the anti-Muslim Blackwater paramilitary of the Holy Land. And the Templars very quickly became popular with the young noblemen of Europe, whom they actively recruited to their ranks. Moreover, they soon expanded their operations from beyond the Holy Land into continental Europe, where they set up sort of recruiting stations and commanderies. As their job was to protect pilgrims, they also started offering to ferry Christians from Europe to the Holy Land. They were largely exempt from local law and didn't have to pay local taxes because they were a quasi-religious organization. All of this, coupled with the fact that the Templars eventually developed a system of banking whereby you could deposit your money at a Templar commandery in Europe, get an IOU, and then withdraw that money at the Templar commandery in the Holy Land, meant that the Templars became very, very wealthy. In particular, the banking operation was incredibly lucrative, and the Templars even began loaning money to nobles experiencing cash flow problems, including the King of France. So, how does this relate to the Cathars? Well, the Templars were a rather exclusive fraternal club, and kept a lot of their internal affairs to themselves. They were also super wealthy, and exempt from many laws and taxes, so they naturally began to be resented. Add to this the fact that, as more than one historian has pointed out, there was likely some hazing that went on, as happens in many fraternal organizations, and soon the Templars have all sorts of fun stories and rumors circulating about them, including murmurings of heresy. More on that in a second. Supposedly, however, according to the conspiracy theorist, the Templars sympathized with the Cathar cause, and in one version of this conspiracy theory, when the four Cathars spirit away their great treasure from Montsegur, they entrust it to the Templars for safekeeping. If it were money, it just got absorbed into the Templar treasury. If it were the Grail, either the Cup or the Descendant of Christ, the Templars hid it. The problem is that 60 years after the Siege of Montsegur, and we're moving back into the real, actual history now, the Templars became the object of the King of France, Philip IV's, machinations. The issue was that Philip owed the Templars a great deal of money, and so, in 1307, he had the Grand Master of the Order, Jacques de Molay, and a bunch of other Templars arrested on charges of heresy, sorcery, worshipping idols. The Templars were said to have a talking bronze head named Baphomet that gave them advice and they venerated it. Homosexuality and fraud. Now, if you listen to our Papal Abdication podcast, this should sound kind of familiar, because these are also many of the charges that Philip leveled against Pope Boniface VIII several years before. Anyway, the Templars were declared heretics, forcibly disbanded, and their property seized by Philip, thus enabling him to replenish his coffers. But, according to the conspiracy theorists, much like the Cathars, some Templars escaped and were able to take their treasure, along with the Grail, into hiding. This is the point that the conspiracy theories go really off the rails, because there are a lot of people who want to connect the Templars to the Illuminati and the Freemasons and all other sorts of secret fraternal organizations. Many of these legends are actually quite recent and only began to be formulated in the early 20th century. They really began to enter the popular consciousness in the early 1980s with the publication of the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which was very much in the bloodline of Christ vein, and even contended that the Merovingian dynasty of Frankish kings were part of this bloodline. These conspiracies have also had a long and lucrative life in modern literature, from Foucault's Pendulum by Umberto Eco to Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. 
The idea that the Templar treasure still exists, be it money or the grail, has been employed in everything from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade to the Nick Cage National Treasure franchise. These myths even exist in music. In 2003, British heavy metal legends Iron Maiden released their Dance of Death album, and the number four track is entitled Montsegur. I love that song, because it incorporates both the Cathars and the Templars into the myth, except that it adopts yet another variation of the theory, wherein the Templars helped kill the Cathars. But see, that's the great thing about conspiracy theories. You can say pretty much whatever you want. This has been Footnoting History. If you liked our podcast, be sure to check us out on the web at footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as information about upcoming podcasts. Join us next week when we'll be talking about the Lollard heresy of late medieval England. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!